Trustee Mercer and we'll go around and just have everyone do a quick hello for uh, the folks on Zoom. Great. Hello. Hello. Okay. Hi, Marsha. Hello. So you're a little quiet, but I think I recognize all the voices. So I think I will be good. Thank you for doing that for me. Okay, Chair Holland, this is Hatton speaking. It sounds like we are all set for our live stream. Would you like to start the meeting and then have me do Zoom directions, or would you like me to start with the directions? Um, let's start the live feed so that's captured by the recording and live feed. And so I'll call the meeting to order. And let me know when the live feed has started. We're all set there, thank you. Okay, so I will call this meeting to order. And before we start with the formal agenda, I would ask Hatton to explain um, the process for um, making public comment on either agenda or non-agenda items. Um, Hatton, would you mind doing that? Sure thing. Hi, good evening. This is Hatton Littman speaking, the communications director. Welcome to the Board of Trustees meeting. If you're joining us on Zoom, I'll just give you a few tips and tricks for participating in the meeting tonight. If you take your cursor down to the bottom of your screen, you'll notice that there are buttons that say mute or unmute and start or stop video. That's how you'll control what we see and hear from you tonight. Please stay on mute unless you are giving public comment tonight so we can manage uh, clean audio in the meeting. Uh, if you go to the middle of the screen, you'll notice there's a button that looks like a comic book call out window and it says chat. You'll just click on that button if you need to send a chat. Remember that the chat is only uh, chatting me as the manager of the meeting tonight. That chat is not turned on for public comment members of the Board of Trustees will not see your comment. If you'd like to raise your hand to be acknowledged for public comment, you have two options for how to do that. You can either click on the participants button and it will open a white screen and you'll scroll all the way down to the bottom and there should be a raise hand button in that menu. If you've got the newest version of Zoom, you'll look for the button on the far right of the bottom of your screen that says reactions Click on that, and then you'll see a raise hand button there. If you're joining us from the phone tonight, you'll need to press star nine to raise your hand, and then star six to unmute yourself. Thank you very much. Thanks, and with that, I'll call um, this meeting of the regular meeting um, of the MCPS board to order, and I'll welcome everyone. I want to... Um, offer some introductory comments. I had planned to be there in person. I think it would be a little more manageable to see trustees who are raising their hands in person and those raising their hands virtually, but I was filled with a stomach bug this morning and it just seemed a little wiser to stay 
away from a large group of people. So here I am at home. So I'll use Hatton as my eyes and ears in the boardroom. So thanks for making that accommodation. And I will also keep my um, virtual face up because in order to make sure everyone can hear me, I have to have my computer very close to my um, face. And you don't wanna see my face tonight because I look really tired. So I don't wanna distract um, by that um, distraction. So with that, I'll welcome everyone and I'll, I will take roll so I can make sure that everyone is here. I will take roll for the trustees and then I'll take roll for the student trustees to make sure I've grabbed everyone so I can see them on my first page. So bear with me, um, Chair Holland is here, Trustee Abgaris. I am here. Thank you. Trustee Decker. I'm here, thanks. Trustee Hobbins. I'm here. Trustee Lorenzen. Here. Trustee McDonald. Here. Trustee Mercer. Here. Trustee Oldperson. Here. Trustee Sturbus. Here. Thanks. Trustee Vogel. I'm here. And Trustee Wake. Present. Great. So we have all trustees present. And then I see that Jaden um, Bede is here. Malone Ingram is here. Claire Kobach is here. Daisy Kalina is here. Is Eric Lorenz here? I didn't grab him for my first page if he is. And Mariposa um, Ristau from Willard. And I see that Waverly Winterer is here from Hellgate. So we have, um, I think, a representative of almost all the high schools. So with that, we'll stand and say the Pledge of Allegiance. And Hatton's going to make sure that we're looking at the flag in the boardroom. Dr. Watson, do you mind starting us out? Thank you. We're on to item number three on the agenda, which is to review, revise, and approve the agenda. Is there any request from a trustee to modify the agenda in terms of the order or any other type of revision? And I'll look for virtual hands in Hatton if you can let me know if anyone in the boardroom has hands raised. I will let those in the boardroom know because the camera that's got the view of the boardroom is on the far wall. You're about this, you're a little bigger than a grain of sand. So it's a little hard for me to see if hands are raised, but Hatton will assist me with that. So thanks. Any hands raised there, Hatton? No, there are not. Okay, so with that, we'll go ahead and approve the agenda as it has been prepared. And now we move on to item number four, which is to approve the minutes from the regular board meeting of January 26, 2021. Would any trustee want to make or suggest a modification to those minutes before there, um, there is an approval sought? And I'm not seeing any virtual hands, Hatton? I don't have a motion yet in the room. Okay, so is there a motion to approve the minutes from the January 26th regular board meeting? Uh, trustee Old Person is motioned and it appears Trustee Abgaris is seconding. Okay, so we have a seconded motion. All trustees in favor of the motion, um, please, it would probably be most helpful um, just to everyone say aye and so I can or raise your hand or say aye. So I'll listen to voices. Aye. Aye. And aye. I'm an aye, Trustee Holland. Aye. 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 And Trustee Ecker, is that? Aye. Okay, thanks, I, didn't, I just missed your voice. So they are approved unanimously. And so with that, we move on to public comment on non-agenda items. As um, we have explained in the past, these are public comment on items that we won't be discussing or um, t making decisions about tonight, but they can be any item that any member of the public would want to bring to the attention to the district and the board of trustees. We ask three things. Um, please state your first and last name and spell any unusual spelling. Um, two, if you represent an organization, please identify that organization. And we ask you to try to keep your um, comments to three minutes. 
And so with that, I'll look for virtual hands up in the queue. And so as anyone raises their hand for public comment, um, your hand will go up in the queue in the order in which you've raised your hand. I'm not seeing any Hatton, are you? That's correct. Okay, so then um, there is attached written correspondence beginning on page 10 that the trustees have reviewed. And so now we come to student trustee reports and maybe we'll go in reverse order this time. So Waverly, if you want to give your report from Hellgate and if you can just state your first and last name so everyone knows who you are. Okay, hi, can everybody hear me? Yep. Great, hello, I'm Waverly Winter and I'm the student trustee from Hellgate. Um, we've begun our second semester and we're about halfway through our first block of classes, which are periods one, two, and three. As you all are well aware, we're now going to school in person for four days a week instead of just two. Students and staff are getting used to this new format and are appreciating their time in person with fellow students and teachers. Winter sports are well underway as well. The girls and boys basketball teams are playing Big Sky tonight and the girls basketball team are undefeated so far this season. The wrestling season is also in full swing and they are competing against Glacier, Flathead, and Belgrade this weekend. The swimming season has finally begun and they had a meet this past weekend in Butte and they're also having a meet this weekend here in Missoula. Speech and debate have been competing every weekend virtually. National Honor Society and SAVE are working with the Family Resource Center at Hellgate to provide reusable masks and water bottles to students. And Key Club is also selling masks as well. BPA, HOSA, Flagship, and the many more clubs at Hellgate are in full swing and working on new activities and programs at Hellgate. Curling Club has also begun and they're beginning to curl against other curling teams in Missoula. Hellgate Student Government has been doing fabulous live announcements every week and you can go find Hellgate Live's annou live announcements on YouTube at Hellgate Student Government. Student Government is also selling candy hearts with special mes messages throughout the week for Valentine's Day. Thank you all to the teachers and staff for making this weird year so positive and fun despite the many challenges and negatives. Myself and many others appreciate the teachers and staff and all the hard work they are doing. Thank you for your time and have a fabulous evening. Thank you for that Waverly and good for Hellgate for curling. I love curling. And so let's move on to, I think Claire is here from Sealy Swan. I didn't think I saw Eric, but Claire, if you wanna give us an update about Sealy Swan High School and introduce yourself. Sure. And yes, uh, Eric was planned to be here, but I think he's having some technical difficulties. So it'll just be me. Uh, okay. My name is Claire Kovach. I am the student trustee at Sealy Swan High School. And I just want to um, say happy February to everybody. This has definitely been the month of new snow here in Sealy Lake. <laughs> and we hope you're all staying safe on the roads and keeping warm this winter. To start off, uh, BPA had its regional competition last week, and we are super proud to announce that the Sealy Swan has three students who will be advancing to the state competition in March. Uh, congratulations. Oh, there we go. Sorry. No, that's fine. Um, congratulations to Connor, um, who did financial math and analysis, Hannah A, who did entrepreneurship and court as who did interview skills and ethics professionalism. Uh, ski team is loving the big snow dump and finally has some good snow to practice on. So they're excited about that. And they're really ready to have an upcoming race and um, some of their ski events. We had our first prom meeting today and the juniors are excited to host the event. Uh, they will have some extra challenges working with COVID regulations this year, but we have confidence they will be able to plan something uh, the county will be comfortable approving. Right now, the biggest worry is the weather in May. This is the last weekend of preseason games for basketball before the Blackhawks start district tournaments. Right now, the girls team is undefeated with a record of 11-0 and the boys have a record of 5-6. This Thursday, we play our last game versus Victor Pirates. The girls play at home and the boys play them in Victor. As of right now, the district tournament seems like it's going to be played game by game in the higher seeds gym. Finally, the students winter sports sign contest was a huge success. The gym looks more exciting with all the post posters cheering the players on. Student council is busy getting ready to help run the Red Cross blood drive here in Sealy on Wednesday. And currently we have three students signed up to give blood um, and our goal is 10. So we'll see if we'll get some more students. We're excited about that. Uh, thank you 
and have a nice night. Thank you, Claire. And now we'll move on. I believe Daisy and Malone from Sentinel are here. So uh, I don't know who wants to start. I know you guys usually have a certain order. So go ahead and let us know what's going on at Sentinel and introduce yourselves. All right, I will start off the report this time. So good evening, everyone. Once again, my name is Daisy and I'm here with Malone and we're from Sentinel. So these past few weeks, Sentinel has made a smooth transition into our second semester. Students are now focused on three classes at a time as they'll cycle through periods one through three each day. Additionally, students now have an in-person schedule Tuesday through Friday, meaning that all students A through Z are attending in person together again. In sports news, Sentinel is busy as usual. This Saturday, our boys and girls basketball teams face Flathead High School, both beating Flathead. Um, so far, our boys varsity team is undefeated this season, which is pretty exciting. Um, this week, our girls and boys basketball teams will play Helena um, on Thursday at Capitol on Saturday. Last Friday, our boys wrestling had, an, had a successful home meet against Flathead High School. And this week, we're, they're gearing up to face Capital and Helena as well. For swimming, swimming is in full swing. They had a lot, uh, they had meet last weekend, and they're now gearing up for state in a few weeks. With winter sports coming to a close altogether, students are already preparing and looking forward to spring sports. So with that, I'll turn it over to Malone for the rest of the report. Thank you. Thanks, Daisy. Can everyone hear me okay? Yep, loud and clear, Malone. Perfect, okay, so I'm Malone and I'm from Sentinel. And as for clubs and activities, they are more than busy as well. Speech and Debate is wrapping up their season with national qualifiers this weekend. After taking a strong fifth place at state, we hope to send some Spartans to nationals. Just like the rest of the season, nationals will be held virtually this summer. The yearbook is interviewing speech and debate members about their season. Amnesty International is in the middle of a fair trade chocolate fundraiser to raise money for possible events this spring and spread the word about Amnesty. They are also sending virtual Valentines to children at St. Jude's Hospital. Student government is busy planning events for second semester. Their biggest endeavor is a virtual talent show where students will be submitting auditions all throughout February. They are currently doing a Valentine fundraiser where students can buy sweets to send to their Valentine that will be delivered this Friday. They are also being paired with pen pals from a local nursing home to write letters back and forth. Last week, seniors were able to buy a class of 2021 shirt provided by Student Gov. And National Honor Society just kickstarted their tutoring initiative where an NHS member will be paired with an underclassman in need of help with core classes and electives and they're looking for volunteer opportunities around the community. Um, Model United Nations is planning on competing at a virtual conference in March. And in other news, our very own Mr. Nelson, the band teacher, was named the High School Educator of the Year. And thank you so much for hearing our report. We're looking forward to another semester of serving as student trustees. Thank you, Malone and Daisy. It sounds like a lot going on at Sentinel. And now on to Big Sky, Jaden. Hi everyone, my name is Jaden Bede and I'm the trustee for Big Sky. Um, so as usual, my uh, report will be broken up into two specific parts. One is an overview of kind of what's happening at Big Sky, whether it be in academics and schedules or just certain, thing go certain things going on that are facilitated by Ms. Courtney, what have you. And then the second half will be on athletics and activities. So now for that overview. Um, so what's going on with schedules currently is that students are busy requesting their courses for the 2021-2022 school year. And uh, there is discussion of possibly having all three of our high schools on the same schedule. So therefore students are requesting seven classes with an eighth period alternate. And our principal is having that data to present to Dr. Watson in the future. We're going, we are seeing growth in the number of IB diploma students while gaining that data and those signups and wanna make sure that we have the right classes offered for them if we are going to make this switch to that seven period classes to the seven classes or eight. Um, our incoming ninth graders are also working on requesting those periods of classes for next year. Our March family engagement opportunity is filling up fast. It's going to be on March 4th. Big Sky families are invited to sign up for that 
for a tour of our ag center and meet baby animals and receive a meat gift basket from our schoolhouse meats that is local to the ag center. There is now also a Big Sky Class of 2021 parent Facebook group that's led by by Miss Courtney. This gives her an opportunity to share big events that are being planned and to help celebrate the class of 2021, along with graduation planning and other bigger, um, you know, milestones for the class of 2021. So if you want to be a part of that Facebook group, I encourage you to check it out. And then finally, the first week, week back with all students has gone over well. However, our administration is continuing to remind students of mask expectations and considering staggered release times for the lunch and the end of day in order to accommodate some of the traffic flow within our hallways. With that being said, um, um, uh, Ms. Bede, who is our athletic director, would like to continue to remind our Eagles to be respectful, be responsible, be resilient, and be an Eagle, which is our Eagle code. This leads me into our athletics and activities. So kind of what's going on in activities, as always, Big Sky activities are doing a phenomenal job at doing community outreach, whether it be our BPA chapter that is still looking for um, another community outreach after our last one, which was tying blankets that went to our community resource center, whether it be HOSA and Kiko club who are currently doing various drives. National Honor Society is also doing a change drive this week in order to help the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society who reached out. There's also a link for that that I will um, email to anybody if they would like. So please do reach out to me if you would like that link in order to help donate to those kids with those cancers, which are just simply so awful. And then looking at athletics, um, a super shout out to our Big Sky Speech and Debate team for placing sixth this year at state. And our AD would like to Congratulate the following state placers. Myself placing second in Lincoln Douglas debate, Madison McDonald placing sixth in Lincoln Douglas debate, Brady McBride placing fifth in humorous interpretation, Fiona Morrow placing sixth in legislative debate, and Brandon Hensley placing eighth in legislative debate. We also had many others break to finals, so congr a huge congratulations to them also. Overall, we thought this was a very successful state tournament, seeing much growth and having much placement. This week, um, our speech and debate team will host the national qualifiers along with Sentinel and Hellgate, and we hoped and are expecting to have a few qualifiers from Big Sky as in previous years. So um, winter postseason information about winter sports. The Montana High School Association announced on Friday that Class AA will now have a state tournament in the format for basketball. The state AA basketball tournament will be in Great Falls at Four Seasons Arena March 10th through the 13th. Instead of a divisional Class AA basketball teams will have a one game playoff to determine which teams advance to the state tournament. The format for both the East and the West divisions will be power protect with the higher seed hosting. The MHSA also announced that state AA wrestling will meet at Kalispell Flathead High School March 5th through 6th. Class AA wrestling will not have the traditional Eastern and Western AA seeding tournaments. Instead, wrestlers will be seeded straight into state. The first all-class girls wrestling tournament will be February 19th through the 20th at Lockwood High School in Billings. And finally, the AA swimming meet will be held in Great Falls on March 5th. Spring sports are also set to begin on March 15th with track and field, tennis, and softballs. Open gyms have begun in preparation for this seat for this season. Thank you guys so much for this time in order to present these reports. We really appreciate being able to let you know what's going on at Big Sky. And a huge shout out to all of our clubs and activities for continuing to do such an amazing job in this crazy time. Our administration and teachers for supporting us and our activities who continue to just power through and do great things for our community. Thank you. And thanks to all our student trustees. We really appreciate hearing how schools are doing in any year, but in particular this year, it is really, um, heartening to hear how resilient you all have been in the face of what we thought would be a short period of time. And now we're almost going into year. It's almost been a year. So thank you all for being here. As you know, if you need to get to other activities, feel free to leave the meeting at any time. And we'd love to have you stay for as long as you can. And so with that, I'll turn it over to the um, report announcements from superintendent. So Dr. Watson, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Chair Holland. Can you hear me okay? I can. All right. Uh, as usual, all of my announcements were taken by the student trustees, which is great. Uh, they have lots of stuff going on, and they're very good about reporting on what everything that's happening. But I'll just mention a couple of things. So our next board meeting is February 23rd at 6 o'clock. Also, we have spring break coming up in the middle of March, March 15th. I want to remind um, everyone that might be listening this evening that parent-teacher conferences for, for grades K through 8 happen on March 11th and 12th, or the week of March 11th and 12th. So uh, those parent-teacher conferences will be held virtually, just like they were in the fall. Uh, but just wanted to remind everyone about those important days. 
Uh, the other thing that um, I had the opportunity to attend uh, a week and a half ago was an uh, honorary um, opportunity to honor uh, Lewis Nelson, who is the high school educator of the year, as uh, designated by the Missoula Education Foundation. As you're, you remember, they, they honor a high school educator, a middle school educator, and an elementary educator. Uh, the honor for Mr. Lewis I'm sorry, Mr. Nelson happened um, during a, a basketball game. Uh, Pep Band was there playing it at the game, and uh, so Mr. Nelson was able to be honored in front of his students, which was really nice. Um, and it was a surprise for him, so that was another bonus as well. And just uh, congratulate Mr. Nelson. And, and then once we know the middle school and the elementary ones, I will, sure, I will be sure to report those names here at the board meeting. And then the last thing, as was mentioned, uh, quite a few state tournaments coming up. So the national qualifier for speech and debate is coming up this weekend. Uh, but also we have state wrestling uh, the first week of March. That happens in Kalispell. And then state swimming is the first week of March. And that happens, uh, it's a one day meet. It happens in Great Falls. And then state basketball, um, for any of our teams that qualify for state basketball, that will happen the second week of March, also in Great Falls. What uh, we're doing right now is obviously um, uh, looking at the protocols for those tournaments and deciding you know, how things will be run at those tournaments. We're also discussing um, travel for our students, number of buses that we might send um, to keep everyone safe in these, in these times of COVID. So those are some of the logistics that we're working on for the state tournaments, but those tournaments are coming up fairly quickly, so I just wanted the board to be aware of that. And that's all I have to announce. Now we'll move on to, um, thank you, Dr. Watson. We'll move on to item number seven, which is the consent agenda. As has been explained in the past, Items that are put on the consent agenda are items we see as a routine item. It's, they are considered fairly perfunctory. Any trustee who wants to have an item taken off the consent agenda to allow for trustee discussion can do so at any time. And so there are two, I think two, on the consent agenda. One is an elementary action item and the other one is a secondary action item. So. When they are on the consent agenda, there is no board discussion, but there can be public comment, although no comments on any particular individuals, but I don't think there would be in any case. And so with that, um, I would ask if there's a motion to acknowledge the MCPS student attendance agreements that are found on page 13, and that would be a motion from a K-12 trustee. And so Hatton, I don't know if there's someone in the boardroom, otherwise I'll look for hands. Yep, on Trustee F. Garris. Okay, and is there a second? Trustee Lorenzen. Thank you. And so as I indicated, there will not be any board discussion, but is there any general public comment on this action item? I'm not seeing any hands go up in the queue. So we'll go ahead and all those trustees in favor of the motion to acknowledge the attas, attached list of elementary students requesting to attend other school districts, please indicate by saying yes or raising your hand. And so I can look for, so trustee McDonald, trustee Decker has have their hands raised and trustee, in the trustee Mercer, trustee old person, trustee Abgaris, trustee Hobbins. Uh, Thanks. Trustee Lorenzen. Uh, are there any votes? No. No, there are not. Okay, thanks, then the motion passes. And then the second item on the consent agenda, is kind of the reverse of what was just considered, which is to ratify out of district attendance agreements where um, the request is to approve the attached out of district, district high school student attendance agreements. So these would be students requesting to enroll in accordance with out of, out of district attendance agreements. Is there a motion to, uh, to ratify the out of district attendance agreements found on page 14? Trustee Avgaris. And is there a second? Trustee Old Person. Okay, and as I had previously indicated, there is no board discussion. Is there any general public comment? And I will look for hands raised in the queue. 
I don't see any. So all trustees in favor of approving the, um, let me get it, of ratifying, I'm just trying to get the right language, of the motion to ratify the out of district attendance agreements, please indicate by raising your hand. And my hand is raised. I'm just, I don't have enough hands to find my virtual hands. So Trustee Holland votes yes. Trustee Decker voted yes. Trustee McDonald voted yes. Trustee Wake voted yes. And I think those are all on Zoom. And oh, trust, yeah, I said Trustee McDonald. And in the um, boardroom, Hatton? Trustee Mercer, Trustee Sturbis, Trustee Old Person, Trustee Lorenzen, Trustee Afgaris, and Trustee Hobbins. And then Trustee Vogel had unmuted herself. Oh, okay. Yeah. Vogel is yes. Okay, thanks, Trustee Vogel. Thanks for reminding me, Trustee Hatton. And so, so any no's? So that motion to ratify the out of district agreements um, passes. Then we move on to approve the second reading of the revi revised board policy 1512 conflict of interest. As the trustees will recall, and I'll turn it over to Pat in a second, but we had considered this at the last meeting and we tabled it because Pat wanted to double check on some language that was in the version before us at the last meeting. So Pat, um, go ahead and give us a little bit more background. All right, thank you. So uh, the policy is on page 15 and uh, you'll see that uh, about three quarters of the way down the page, there are uh, a couple of lines that are bolded and uh, the, the version that was presented uh, before did not uh, include the exceptions of officials in the one uh, paragraph and then the following paragraph, uh, it, uh, uh, some verbiage was repeated. It repeated a business or undertaking before and after uh, economic detriment. So uh, the language now is, is consistent with the statute MCA 2-2-105, which is referenced at the uh, end of the policy. Uh, otherwise, the, uh, the policy uh, reads as it was uh, uh, published. Okay, and as the background information indicates, um, the trustee, or the trustee, the policy was posted for public comment and there was, as I understand it, there was no public comment received. And so with the um, correction to delete the redundant language, um, is there a motion to adopt revised board policy 1512. And Trustee McDonald has voted, has moved to approve the policy. Is there a second? Trustee Sturbis. Okay, thank you. And so the motion has been seconded. Is there any board comment? Is there any public comment? I'm, I'm just not waiting seeing for any. a second in case there's a leg. I don't see any hands raised. So all motions or all trustees in favor of the motion to adopt revised board policy 1512 um, titled conflict of interest, please either indicate by saying yes or raising your hand. And I'm a yes. And trustee Vogel, if you can unmute yourself and I will look for hands raised virtually. Vogel is yes. I'm looking to see Trustee Wake is yes and Trustee McDonald. I, I think she might have stepped away. I'll call the roll in the room while we wait for Trustee McDonald. Trustee Mercer, Trustee Sturbis, Trustee Old Person, Trustee Lorenzen, Trustee Afgaris, and Trustee Hobbins all vote yes. Okay. And I'm just going to check because it looks like. Trustee Decker, thank you. We saw your hand up. Yeah. I thought I had said Trustee Decker, but I apologize. And I, I, so any no's? There are no no's. So I'm, I'm going to make an assumption that Trustee McDonald had to leave the meeting for a short moment. Oh, her hand just went up. So it is now unanimous as to all trustees present. And so now we move on to B, teaching and learning. And this is information only. It is an update on COVID-19. And so Dr. Watson, I'll turn it over to you and I'll mute myself and I'll let you and your team explain what um, the update is. All right, thank you, Chair Holland. I um, have 
a number of things to update the board on this evening, uh, not the least of which is just some uh, information about the transition to phase two and some feedback from, from our principals and from our staff. But before we get to that, I'll just share the, the current COVID, COVID data with the board. So this is our COVID spreadsheet that's available on our website. Hopefully you can see that on your screens. I know for the trustees in the room, it's very, very small, I apologize. But basically I wanted just to note that uh, the week ending 129, the last week of January, we had 10 new cases. And then the week ending uh, February 5th, we had 12 new cases. So we were seeing a decline in the number of new cases, uh, similar to what the county is experiencing as well. And we also keep track of the number of active cases on specific days. And we actually usually use Mondays and um, we pick a day to just measure the number of active cases in the, in the district. So as of this last Monday, we had nine active cases in the district. Um, and then we do a comparison to the county. And what we're looking at there is we're looking at the number of active cases on Monday per 10,000 people in the county. And so if you were to do some math with the county numbers, you would see there was 16, almost 17 cases per 10,000 people in the county. So we like to do a comparison to where we're at on that same day because we have about 10,000 people um, in the district. Let me stop sharing that and just share one more thing. Hopefully this one will be a little easier to see for everybody, but the other thing that <coughs> we update every single week um, is our indicators, um, our, our, what we call our data dashboard. And so this is for the week ending 2-5, February 5th. Uh, the data is all, all of this that you're gonna see is district data. So you can go our, to our website and look um, back at any week that you'd wanna look at, but we track um, basically six things of six pieces of information that are district data. Uh, the first thing is the number of new cases over seven days. So as I just mentioned to you, we had 12 new cases at the end of, if you look over that whole week, we had a total of 12 new cases. And so we've put some markers on here to sort of measure um, where we're at in terms of green, yellow, orange, or red, obviously for number of new cases. We also track, um, the percentage of the active cases as it relates to the county. So the county has seen a dramatic decrease in the number of active cases. Our decrease has not been as so dramatic as the county, but we're still running at about half of what the county is running per 10,000. We also look at the route of transmission. This is done through case investigation. And so we look at the percentage of cases that are confirmed as transmission outside of the school setting. So at the end of that week of um, February 5th, we had 75% of our new cases were trans, uh, transmission occurred outside the school setting. We also, at the end of each week, add up the number of students or staff that are in quarantine. And as a person would be in quarantine if they are a close contact to a confirmed case. It could be that the confirmed case was somebody in school, or it could be that the confirmed case is somebody outside of school. But if I came in contact with that person and I'm considered a close contact and I'm ordered to quarantine by the health department, um, this is how I would get on this list. So we track the number of close contacts over the course of a week. So at the end of February 5th, we had 74 students or staff members in close, that were considered close contacts. For comparison, if you look back on our chart, there's been weeks where we've had well over 100. In fact, there was one week in November where we had over 200 close contacts. Um, so it's been averaging anywhere from 70 to 100 for, for quite a few weeks now. Uh, we also are looking at our staffing. Remember that we continue to tell you that staffing is probably one of our largest concerns. So what we look at is the either um, certified or classified staff, the percentage of certified and classified staff that are out of the building for whatever reason. And we like to see the numbers obviously as low as they can be, but what we track is um, any schools that uh, have a percentage. So for example, at 6-8, we had one school that was at 1% and 
at 912, we had two schools that were at 1% absence. So we're doing pretty well with staffing, actually improving in the last couple of weeks. Um, and then uh, again, this is as of last Friday, so we track this every week. And the last thing we do is we track the length of time it takes us to contact trace. So as soon as we find out about a case, we track the length of time it takes us to contact trace within the district using our, of course, our staff to do that. And we like to see that less than 18 hours. Actually, it's been less than 12 hours in terms of the um, length of time to, to do the contact tracing. All right, maybe one other thing here. <clears throat> okay, so I just wanna update the board on a few other things. So uh, we went through the COVID numbers. We're gonna talk about vaccines very briefly. Um, I wanna tell you that what we're developing is a remote learning plan. I'll, I'll kind of just describe that briefly. We'll give you an MOA update. Um, also discuss um, support for our BIPOC students as that's been a topic of conversation with our COVID task force. So we already looked at the COVID numbers, so I'm not gonna go through those again, but those are available on our website. If um, there's folks in the public that wanna track that information, you can go all the way back to the start of the school year to look at that summary data, and you can go week by week to track that. Vaccines, uh, as I think most people are aware, but I just wanted to announce to the board that currently Missoula is in the, is in the group 1B. That means any, any of those individuals in 1B are, are receiving vaccines. Uh, we do have some staff members that are in group 1B. They qualify for a variety of different reasons. So we do have some staff members that are getting vaccines. In, in total, probably almost 100 of our staff members have been vaccinated, either because they were in group 1A or group 1B. Of course, the vast majority of our, of our staff will qualify under group 1C as essential workers or frontline workers, which is in 1C. Um, wanted the board to be aware that once a week we participate on a call with the county um, specifically to get updates about vaccines. So currently there's 1,500 vaccines uh, coming into the county each week. So obviously that's not enough to get, to get um, vaccines moving really quickly. So we're hoping that that number increases over time. But right now there's 1,500 vaccines coming into the county each week. Uh, there's, and just for comparison's sake, in that group 1B, uh, they estimate 40,000 Missoula residents are in that group 1B. So it's gonna take a while to get through that 40,000 unless we can start seeing an increase in the number of vaccines coming into the county. We as a district have applied to be a provider, um, which means that we could provide our own vaccines to our staff. Uh, we've gone through all the processes and procedures that we need to do that. Our status has been put on hold by the state just because there's not enough vaccines coming into our county right now. Um, one of the other things we've done is we've developed a remote learning plan and we did this for two reasons. There could be an opportunity or a time when a classroom has to go to remote learning, full remote learning. Could be a school that has to go to remote learning or there could be a, a time in the future where the entire district um, is required to go fully remote. Maybe a, you know, a stay at home order is put in place by the, by the governor or something like that, something like we experienced last spring. So we wanted to have a remote learning plan ready to go. And in the plan, we're identifying student expectations, staff expectations and parent expectations. We've, inc we've included both synchronous and asynchronous learning activities as an expectation. So if we had to go to remote, we would have to make sure we um, get the um, devices checked out to students that need them so that they could do synchronous learning activities at home um, um, as part of the remote learning plan. And then also we would need a plan for food service if we went remote. So I just wanted to let the board know that we're working on this. It's not complete yet, but it's close. and. We wanna make sure this is ready to go in case we do have to go remote. Um, I asked Ray Cooper to be on the call this evening and she's, she's with us. Um, so if we have any questions about MOA, sh I know she can answer a lot better than I can, but I'm just gonna give you some, a brief overview of, of MOA updates. So currently as of the start of second semester, we had just over 1500 students 
K-12 that were enrolled in MOA, the online academy. You'll recall that we started the year with over 1,900, so a lot of students moved back and forth in terms of moving into the MOA or moving out of the MOA, but currently we have just over 1,500. Um, majority of the students in the MOA did participate in the STAR assessment. That's our district assessment. They are showing academic progress, which is encouraging. Uh, a lot of students on track towards proficiency in reading and math as measured by STAR. And then I also wanted to let the board know that we are planning for next year. Um, we anticipate we will need the MOA next year in, in some form. Uh, we're working on a survey for families. We wanna plan for a little bit more coordination with some of the in-building programs. What we noticed for like our high school students is the types of electives available in the MOA were not the same as the electives in the regular high school. So we wanna do a little bit more coordination between the MOA and the schools. And then obviously we're probably gonna use CARES Act resources to cover at least a portion of the MOA next year. As was uh, brought up in one of our board meetings, we, um, we know that it's important to support our BIPOC students and our families we know that the COVID um, pandemic has a, a much harder effect on our BIPOC families. Um, statistically, BIPOC students and families um, are contracting COVID at a higher rate and resulting in more hospitalizations and, and unfortunately more deaths. So uh, we know that we, we need to make sure as a district we, we recognize the support and the need for our BIPOC students through this pandemic. What uh, we did is we took this topic to our COVID task force. We had two conversations about this um, just to get things started. Uh, we're not finished with this plan yet, but what, what we asked the COVID task force is two questions. Number one, what are the barriers or challenges for BIPOC students who are attending um, either in person or in MOA? And we also asked, um, what specific actions we could take as a district to overcome those barriers. I, I won't go through the entire list. Um, that list will become part of our, our plan that we're developing to support our students. But I did wanna just mention a couple of things that came up out of those two questions. So when you think about barriers and challenges, we know that uh, sometimes access to technology and access to curriculum resources can be difficult, uh, especially for students that might be in the MOA. Um, we also heard that, um, that there is a need for staff understanding related to BIPOC families and the role of extended families and absences. So we understand that that's a, that's a barrier potentially for our students um, for success. And then uh, one of the other things we heard is that throughout this pandemic, there's been lost opportunities for school uh, community building with our BIPOC families and we recognize that. Um, we know that pre-pandemic, we our, uh, our Indian Education Department had a number of um, activities and they're still doing some of those, but obviously we've lost some opportunities for that community building, which uh, we're, we're gonna have to problem solve around that to make sure we can, we can continue to have that. And then, for the second question, when we started talking about what specific actions the district could do, I just wanna give you a couple things that came out of the discussion, which um, we will write into our action plan. So one of the things that the uh, committee recommended was they analyze our achievement data specifically for BIPOC students and target those students in need for summer options or options outside the typical school day. Uh, obviously, thing we can always get better on is improving communications with families and making better connections. I uh, thought a great suggestion was to include our Native American specialists as part of our school-based intervention teams when working with BIPOC students. I think that's critically important and, it, and I would say in a lot of times they are included but we just wanna make sure that that's available and known to our schools. And then another great suggestion that came from the committee is we, we need a specific family resource specialist that's dedicated to the MOA. So all of our schools have family resource specialists, but we, didn't, we don't have one that's dedicated strictly to MOA. And we recognize that's a, that's a need and something we can work towards um, improving. So those are just some examples. Um, we actually took all the suggestions from the COVID task force 
and we included that in an action plan, and I'll be presenting that um, to the board at a future meeting. All right, so I wanted to also tell the board just uh, a few things about our transition to phase two, just so you had a snapshot and a picture of how things are going. Uh, remember that half of the district um, transitioned on the 26th of January, the other half on February 2nd. Just a real brief description, remember that phase two means more in-person days. We increased capacity in our schools and our classrooms. Um, main, we are maintaining that shortened schedule that helps with busing, so we have a staggered start in the morning and a staggered release in the afternoon for our different grade levels. Um, we also continued the intensive block schedule at 612 because that's, that block schedule helps us to reduce the number of contacts in a given school day. And then obviously as much as possible maintaining cohorts of students whenever possible. Uh, we've got a ton of pictures. I know that's really hard for you to see that picture in the boardroom here, but Hatton did a great job capturing a number of pictures across the district and we'll be sure to get those either on the website or available to board members so you can take a look at various classrooms. This is a K-5 classroom that has students in a, in a circle, um, in a group. Um, and I just wanted to talk uh, briefly about some things that, are, that, we, that I heard about um, successes and challenges for K-5. You'll see this first bullet common to almost every, um, every grade level, but really um, students and staff are, are excited to be back with their classmates. I know that um, for, a, for what I heard from a lot of staff members is it felt like it was the first week of school because this was the first time that they had a chance um, for, their a, for their A group to meet their B group, so it really did feel like the first week of school. Um, our staff worked incredibly hard, not only our teachers, but our classified staff, our custodians, uh, secretaries, everyone worked very, very hard to make the transition smooth as it could be. Um, there's just a couple of challenges um, that we continue with. Our lunches um, in our elementary schools in many places, um, they're spreading out the lunch, uh, the lunch areas. They're trying to come up with other areas in the building where they could eat lunch so that kids can spread out a little bit. Um, so, and then even if, even outdoors, if you go over to Paxson, um, our, our maintenance crew constructed an outdoor eating venue at Paxson that's pretty amazing. So if you drive by there, um, you'll, you can see it. Um, we, we also noticed that there's more kids on buses, and so we, we are working with Beach to get seating charts for the buses, so that will help. Um, we also, and, and you'll see this common at every grade level, we've seen um, some anxiety come up from uh, among our students um, with this transition. Anytime that there's a transition, and like I said before, if it feels like the first week of school, there, there's gonna be some anxiety. So we have seen some uh, a need for more help for some of our students that are anxious about this transition. The last thing I'll mention about K-5, physical distancing is not always possible at K-5. We, teachers are doing the very best they can, but we want um, our community to know that it's not always possible to physical distance in a school building. So the layering of mitigation strategies has become really important to make sure we're doing a number of mitigation strategies. Uh, just a couple other things about middle school. Um, same thing, excited to be together, smooth transition. Um, our staff worked incredibly hard to make, make sure it worked. I was at uh, Meadow Hill today and one of the things that they figured out is to do some hand wash stations, some portable hand wash stations in some of the common areas because they didn't have uh, sinks in their classrooms. So that's just an example of what they've done to try to, to make it better. Um, they're also creating flexible areas for lunch in all of our middle schools wherever possible. Um, again, when I spoke to our middle school principals today, they also said the social emotional needs they've noticed are higher in the last couple of weeks, um, which is just mean, means that we have to increase support for our students. Um, the lunchtime, the hand washing um, procedures are still getting refined. And then again, physical distancing, not always possible in the middle schools but we do, we're doing the best we can, and I think our teachers are doing the best they can. High school, um, what, what's interesting about high school is that not only we, did we start a second semester, which is a big transition for high school, but also we started this um, 
four days per week. And, and so what I heard is that um, this transition has really created opportunities um, where they've, the high schools have decided to restart some other things like school clubs and some other activities in the, in the building during the day which create school culture. So that's, uh, that's good to hear that um, we're starting to see some of that. And then um, again, st our staff worked incredibly hard to make sure it was smooth. Um, I know that our high school staff in many situations had to rearrange classrooms, um, you know, make sure that, um, that they had um, everything they needed in their classrooms. So I know it was incredibly difficult to get that done, but um, really, really happy that our staff um, was able to do that. Uh, one of the high schools did a survey about lunchtime because there was a concern that students were mixing at lunchtime. And it was interesting what they found out, and this was a small survey, small survey sample, but most students were eating uh, with, a small, with the same small cohort e at each lunchtime. And in many situations, that cohort was the same group of friends they, t they hung out with outside of school. So that was encouraging because um, hopefully there's less contact tracing when they're eating lunch with basically the same group of friends every day. Um, also noted in high school, uh, increased level of mental health support is needed. And we know that we've got students that were anxious about the transition. So just making sure we're, we're able to support them. So uh, with that, I did ask several of our principals to be on tonight as well as some other folks that might be able to answer any questions you might have. Um, got K-5 principal 68912. Uh, Vinny Giamona is on the call. Vinny is our COVID response coordinator. Vinny and our um, health services supervisor, Brooke, were out in many classrooms helping provide advice or helping um, give ideas on how to set up classrooms. So I know that if you have questions about that, he would answer those. Amy Shattuck works directly with um, our Native American specialists and she can, she can speak to the plan that we're working on for our BIPOC students. And then uh, Ray Cooper, as I mentioned, principal of the MOA and um, Elise Guest is on as well um, for a different topic this evening, but she has been working pretty closely with our principals on that remote learning plan. So I'm gonna stop there because my voice is about ready to cut out anyway and just see if the trustees have any questions or, or comments for us. And I'll so stop sharing. I will look for hands up virtually and Hatton, if you can let me know if any trustees at the boardroom have hands up. Trustee old person. Okay, go ahead, trustee old person. Thank you, Chair Holland. Dr. Watson, you talked about mental health for high school students. Is there mental health? Um, can you speak about that to the staffing, the MCPS staffing, the teachers? How is that with them? Yeah, you know, I, I would defer to some of our principals. I, I do want to mention that this, is, um, this has not been an easy transition for anyone. And our staff um, has done just really an amazing job, but I also know it's been very, very stressful for our staff. Um, I, I would tell you that um, we, have a, we have a workplace wellness program that is available to staff um, that, that Dave could describe more if you're interested in hearing about that. But I, I think it's probably worthy to hear from a couple of principals just in terms of how their staff is coping with this change. So I'll look to see if any of the principals want to raise their hands and give it a shot in terms of answering trustee old person's question. Go ahead. Jennifer, go ahead. Or thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so from the high school perspective, and certainly I can only speak for, for my building, but I think it's echoed across all high schools. Um, you know, I think one of the the pieces that we have that's very valuable is as a staff, we meet together every Monday. So that's one of the ways that we use our Mondays is we kind of ground the week with, um, you know, maybe issues or concerns or considerations that came up from the week before. Um, we're able to address those as a collective group as we lead into the week. Um, and it gives me an opportunity to hear um, their concerns and their voice, for example, um, you know, with, with the kind of updated mask um, considerations around double uh, layering neck gaiters. That was a real concern for our, our students and some of the, the families. And so being able to address that with our staff, so they, they know that 
as a building principal, I'm grounded in the work for the week, I think is really helpful. Um, and I think just giving staff an opportunity to share their concerns, being very present. I know all the leaders that are on this call are um, in the building, uh, making sure that we're checking in, kids can see us, staff can see us. So I think it's really just those simple things and taking the time to, to meet with everyone and have that open door. It certainly doesn't address all the mental health concerns that we might be seeing because we may be experiencing them as well. Um, but I think being present has been the most valuable thing for, for at least our staff. I don't know if anyone, oh, go ahead, Pam. I was gonna say, um, whoops, at Rattlesnake, um, we have a, the, for the month of February, have a self-care challenge and we've given the teachers some mindfulness tools. And then we're doing some collective things, sharing, um, sharing how we use those tools. We actually have little drawings and just some incentives to um, take care of ourselves and take care of each other. So, um, um, Barbara, go ahead. I'm trying to make sure I catch every hand. Hi, Marcia. Um, uh, at Lowell, we started a healthy habits challenge this month, similar to what Pam's doing. And we have a 10,000 step challenge and we meet every Tuesday at the end of the day and staff can go walking and do things together. We're building a little indoor track in our building to track steps. So I see more and more staff doing those kinds of things on their breaks. And so just trying to focus on wellness and having those opportunities to check in on things that just aren't related to school and COVID. Any other thoughts? Oh, go ahead, Casey. I, I mean, I wouldn't add anything new from what the other uh, principals spoke about, but I think that opportunity, I think um, Jennifer reached out and letting, letting teachers know that we're there for them and giving them some grace, even just to have that conversation with them to, I think our teachers are hardest on themselves and reminding them that uh, it's a tough time for everyone and to, to remind them to take care of themselves because I think they forget that sometimes. Thanks. Um, any other trustee questions of any of the folks on the call? I'll, I'll defer to you Hatton in terms of trustees in the room and I'll look for trustees raising their virtual hands or trustee Decker has her hand up. Go ahead, trustee Decker. Thanks. Um, I was really glad to hear about the conversation that's underway about supporting um, BIPOC families and, and others who have been impacted at a higher level by the pandemic. And I'm, I continue to be curious, and I don't know if the district is exploring ways to find out about this, but I'm really curious about people who don't see the MOA as an option for them and what we might be considering doing um, to try to make it more of an option. Um, I know it's a difficult thing to try to pin down because people who have opted out because they didn't think it would work for them probably haven't necessarily shared that at any place. But if there are people who are very concerned about being what they see as forced into the buildings without a choice, then they aren't really seeing the MOA as a choice. So my question is, are we continuing to explore how to find out if if there's more interest um, in the MOA, if we're able to provide some more support? So that's one. And my other question um, is a question about grading and about um, sort of evaluation criteria during the pandemic and how, if at all, we're able to be, uh, I think we're all excited to see that, you know, many students are in fact like resilient and amazing and teachers are meeting them where they are and are helping them. And, you know, those star test scores and other things are coming along, but I'm sure that report card time was stressful for some who see changes in what their school experience looks like on paper through really no fault of their own because it's a pandemic, right? So I'm just curious about what, if anything, we're able to do as a district to really reflect that in the way that we evaluate students um, in the way that we think about GPA this year versus pass fail, any of those kinds of things, if those are still part of the discussion. So I don't know if someone wants to try to um, provide some information for the first question, and we might need to be reminded what the first question was, but Dr. Watson, I don't know if that would go to you <coughs> or Ray yeah. or, or who you would suggest. Yeah, I think, I think any, of, any of us can answer it for our level. Um, I would tell you that one of the things we committed to was providing a lot of flexibility for families that wanted to transition to the MOA. 
to the point of not cutting it off at semester when semester started, we're, we're still allowing families to go in. I think our, our principals um, would tell you that they've got a pretty good handle on, on support for families and families that are struggling. So, you know, they may want to weigh in on this, but, but Ray, I know, could probably talk to just what she's seeing in the MOA and sort of what families have come in and types of support for families. Sure. Um, well, we offer obviously devices and hotspots for families that don't have that access. Um, we learned a lot about how we started the MOA first semester versus second semester. So for all of our new students, we were able to offer a technology orientation and our K through five teachers met personally with the families to do that little orientation so that they were familiar on day one on how to join the Google Meet or the Zoom and how to utilize the Seesaw platform or the Google Classroom. In our middle school, we did, the, we did a similar thing where our, teach, our teams met with students to do the orientation. And in high school, our teachers all created videos to share a little about themselves and then orient them to um, the Google Classroom so that they were set up for success on day one. Um, my assistant principal, Robin Nuttall, has, has virtually walked students to class to make sure that they're getting to their classroom and they're, they're settled in for the second semester. So we've really um, tried to bolster the support that we're offering on the technology side. We are located here in the um, technology center, formerly called the business building, and we have a lot of families come to us and we physically help them get on and see how to join the meetings or provide tech support in any way we can. Our IT department has been phenomenal in working with families over the phone. So I feel like technology right now is, is not the barrier. Um, what I saw with students returning to in-person learning, they thought that the MOA was great. Their students learned a lot. Um, the academically their needs were being met, but it was that social ish, the social piece that they were really missing. And so that's why some students chose to go back to the building. And so what we're doing now in the MOA is making sure that we're, we're getting more social opportunities for our students. So in, in K-5, our teachers are really utilizing the office hours to set up social time for students. Um, and then in middle school, we've developed clubs and in high school, we just spent yesterday our PIR day um, with our teachers working on ways to build engagement, build relationships with students so that students are talking more to each other during classes. So I don't know if that, if that helps a little bit, um, Trustee Decker, in answering your question. So, and the, just, just to be real specific on the, the question, I think Trustee De Decker's question is, is a valid question is, how do we really target those families that need support? Um, perhaps they're not succeeding in um, at the school level. Perhaps they're nervous about being there four days a week. How do we target those families and help them with what they need? And that really does happen at the building level. Um, I've participated in a number of conversations with parents and principals about that inter those intervention strategies that happen at the building level. That's where the that's where we're gonna notice that a family is struggling and need extra help. Um, it could be a parent that has contacted their principal and said, I'm really nervous about this four day a week thing. I wanna go to the MA MOA, but I need more support. And I know our principals work on that every single day. It's a, it's a, it's a pass off that's very smooth between the building principal and the administrators at MOA to make sure that we understand which families are going there and which families need support. But Trustee Decker, to, you know, to really specifically answer your question, it really does happen at the building level. I don't know if anyone else wants to weigh in on Trustee Decker's first question. I'll just look for hands up. And if you can remind us again what the focus of your second question was. On grades and GPA. Okay. Dr. Watson, I don't know if that would be you or Dr. Gaster. Yeah. Principal? We yeah, we, we still have a lot of those flexibility policies in place. I know that we've got flexibility around high school graduation requirements if needed. We've got flexibility around grading. Um, I, I would say again that a lot of that's happening at the building level. I would allow any of the principals to chime in if they're interested, but the flexibility is there, Trustee Decker, but I do know that it's, it's, it does happen at the building level. 
And I see that Jennifer Courtney has her hand up. So if you want to provide some information. Um, sure. Happy to. Um, so I'll start by saying one of the things that I, as a building leader, have probably not been very good at is celebrating our students who are doing really, really well. Um, and so I kind of had an aha moment that I was like, why are we not celebrating our honor roll kids? Those kids that have really persevered through this situation. And so that seems to be a really bright spot that we haven't had before at Big Sky. Uh, we have done, I think our team has done a tremendous job of offering pretty significant intervention. So we run zero period every day from eight to 9.30. And that's a really targeted intervention for students who are either failing a course, out on quarantine, missed because they were at an activity. Um, it's our dean of students and two of our certified staff run that. Um, and we also staff that with um, certified staff in math, English, science, social studies to make sure that um, it's kind of a low stakes, um, safe environment for students to come into. And it also allows kids who uh, maybe transportation was an issue. Um, it, it allows a safe, warm place in the building where they can get breakfast before the school day actually begins. Um, and I think the, the staff side of it is we as a building are starting to pursue a full transition to standards-based grading. So we have, um, and Elise has been helping us in this process, um, working through some book studies so that all of our staff has a better understanding around what are the standards we want the students to know and be able to do. Um, and I think that's been a huge shift for our staff. And so one of the things that we did that was really helpful is we asked first semester for our staff to project grades during each of those blocks. So as we got closer to the end of those 11 day blocks, we asked for a projected grade on a four point grading scale. And that dialogue that we were able to have with teachers that kind of questioning as to why is this student getting a one help me understand when I look at your grade book it's not correlating so I think what what we had to do as building leaders is walk our staff through the why of making a huge shift in the culture of their classroom how they assess students why they assess students um, what are they assessing them on and so I think you know our, our staff are starting to make that that emotional transition and being able to let go of some of those things that they felt very strongly about so that we can really get to the root of, of number one what's most important for students to know and number two how are we going to help students be successful in this time and making sure that we're helping to prepare them for the next grade level or post-graduation or career readiness whatever that might be so i think it's actually been a really um, positive opportunity for our staff to, to grow professionally um, to meet the needs of our kids. Anyone else who's in on the meeting? I'm not seeing uh, Elise, Dr. Guest. Thank you. I'd just like to add to what Jennifer Courtney was saying. She brought up some really important points that I think through this whole process, we've really watched staff hone in on that notion of proficiency and mastery of standards and how staff are using their curriculum resources, their knowledge about students and honing in to really individualize their instruction and differentiate to ensure that kids are getting caught up. And, um, and that's really come to light with just watching how staff are digging in and learning more and trying new ways to, to ensure that kids are reaching that proficiency level. So even today, the Lowell staff participated in professional learning with our coaches from our Erla um, company, and they were working all day today on how to further assess and learn where kids are with their reading levels, and then what steps they need to take to make sure that those kids are learning and growing and achieving. And so that, that notion of commitment to professional learning right now and figuring out how to best support students as to get them to that proficiency level is really commendable right now. And, I think that's really a point of interest for us. Any other principals want to add anything? Not seeing hands up. Are sure. there any other questions from trustees? Trustee Abgaris. Go ahead, Trustee Abgaris. Thank you. I just two quick questions. Uh, Rob, you had mentioned in our task force meeting uh, last week that you were going to bring us numbers for uh, the volume of kids that went from 
uh, MOA homeschool back into school for the, uh, um, you know, with our switched every day and then vice versa as well. So I was curious if you were other able to gather those. And my second quick question was, is on our form on our website here that you'd shown up there, for our cause of transmission on the week of January 22nd, we've had a major flip where the number went from, we were in the 70s of known cases outside of school, and then that went into the 20s for the last three weeks, and the unknown cause went into the 70s and 80s. So I was wondering if that was an error, or if that was, that seems like a huge shift to, to see that. So I'm um, just curious about that. So as to the first question, Dr. Watson, well, I, I can answer the second question first. <laughs> That's all right. Okay. Yes, uh, that, that, is, order you'd like. Go ahead. that is a um, that thoughts. was a major faux pas. You're right, Trustee Avgaris. I need to fix that. Um, so yes, you're looking. The problem with this spreadsheet is the titles are too far up on the spreadsheet now. So I I made a mistake. Those two columns should be switched. So I'll, I'll get that fixed. Um, and then as far as the first question, you know. The homeschool one's a little difficult for us to answer right now. We are just in the middle of the enrollment count um, and, and, and that will be at a future board meeting in terms of the enrollment. Do you remember our enrollment count is done twice a year for the state, once in October and once in February. So we'll come back with a, an accurate count. Ray might be able to tell you how many kids transferred out and transferred in, which would give you an MOA idea. It's about 240 total kids back and forth. I don't have the exact breakdown because it's been a bit fluid the last few weeks as far as, um, you know, we were letting students come in without without that enrollment dead, when the enrollment deadline has passed. Um, but it's about 100 students at elementary, about 60 students, we're down, I should say our enrollment is down in the MOA, about 100 at elementary, about 80 at middle school, and about 60 at high school, after all the exchanging has happened. Does that help answer your questions, Trustee you of yours? That was perfect, thank you. Thanks. And Hatton, are there any other hands up in the boardroom? I'm not seeing any hands up virtually. I don't see any. Okay. Well, with that, is there anything else you wanted to add, Dr. Watson, before I check in on public comment? It's yes. an only item? Yes. Uh, people always say they'll only remember the first and the last thing you say. So uh, what, I, what I wanted to say is that, um, you know, any, any success we've had or a smooth transition we've had is, is really the credit um, to our building leaders, to our school staff, custodians, secretaries, food service, teachers, everybody working together. Had it not been for them, we, we would not have experienced a successful transition. Having said that, I, I think it's important for the board to understand that, that there are still challenges. Our, of course, our goal is to minimize transition, transmission in the school and hopefully have no transmission in the school, but realize that you know every day we go to work with 10,000 kids, and so um, we have to recognize there are gonna be challenges. There's gonna be staff members that still have anxiety, students that still have anxiety. We continue to work through that every day. I am I'm so proud of our staff and our principals for tackling this and really taking um, suggestions from the staff, taking suggestions from students or concerns and trying to resolve problems. And that's what our principals do every day. That's what our teachers do every day. And so um, just, got, I, don't, I didn't wanna leave this without saying this, is that the, the work that, that we've seen from our staff has just been tremendous, um, but we know that there's still challenges out there. Thanks for that um, summary, Dr. Watson. And is there any board discussion? Uh, it's an information only item, but we'll take board discussion and then public comment. I'm not, not seeing, seeing any in the room. Okay, and so if anyone who's attending the meeting would like to make public comment, go ahead and raise your virtual hand or un, um, remind folks on the phone how to unmute themselves. Uh, star nine to raise your hand on the phone and star six to unmute. 
Yeah, I don't think I've seen anyone on the phone besides Trustee Vogel, but any hands up? Um, Casey Blue has her hand up. Ms. Ballou, if you want to unmute, and as I indicated, um, if you want to spell your first and last name and then try to keep your comments to three minutes, and if you represent an organization, identify that organization. I say that to you, you know, repeatedly, but I know that you know the rules, but just so everyone else who's listening understands the rules, I appreciate you being the first person to raise your hand so I can remind everyone of the protocols we follow. Yeah. My name is Casey Blue, K A capital C, two small E's, B A L L O U, and I'm the president of the Missoula Education Association. Um, I too wanted to give a huge shout out to our staff who continues to be positive, proactive problem solvers. We absolutely continue to have, you know, guidance that comes in and new protocols or ways to mitigate um, that change. And we want to do our best to make sure that we have a safe and nurturing learning environment every single day. So, um, you know, as we as we continue on, um, that time that we're allowed without students helps to ensure that we have time with students that's valuable, meaningful, and absolutely the best that it can be. So uh, we appreciate all of your comments and your questions, and uh, we love serving our community and our kids. Thanks. Thanks. Any other public comment? Not seeing any hands raised. I Shannon? don't see any either. Okay. Well, it looks like um, this information item is concluded, but I do before we move on to the next item, I wanna thank everyone who came to the meeting prepared to answer our questions. I think the amount of preparation that you have made in terms of being leaders in your buildings and in the district really has made a difference in terms of how this transition period took place. And we really appreciated you taking the time out tonight to attend the board meeting and to answer our questions. So thank you all so much for being here tonight. And with that, we'll turn over to the next agenda item, which is under teaching and learning under new business. It is initiative review process. And so as I understand it, there is a district-wide initiative review process that's been um, undertaken. And so we will be looking, or the district will be looking at various initiatives that exist in the district. And the first initiative that has been um, looked at, although decisions haven't been made, is the International Baccalaureate Program. So I believe Russ Lodge and Dr. Guest are going to be speaking to this. So Rob, do you wanna do introductions or should I just turn it over to them? I think they're ready to go. <laughs> okay, so I don't know who wants to start, but go I, ahead. And there is um, a fairly lengthy background information um, in the agenda that's available to trustees in the public. So go ahead and I'm gonna mute myself, so. Yeah, good evening everybody. I'm Russ Lodge, the assistant superintendent. And there's three of us. There's Dr. Elise Guest and Hatton Littman and myself. Uh, we're here to just uh, give you an information presentation tonight. Uh, as it's, as uh, you mentioned, the um, district is undertaking a new long-term strategic plan that's mentioned in the board packet tonight. One of the things that our little group has been charged with is to evaluate the impact of uh, all the initiatives that the district has. So we are beginning with the International Baccalaureate Program. So the, it's myself, it's Dr. Elise Guest, and a, a, the Director of Curriculum and Instruction and then Hatton Littman, uh, our communications director. So we really wanna take on a very systematized and thorough review, and that's what we've been working on. So tonight we're just presenting to you what we have, uh, the work we have done so far. A very specific reason why I have a lot of confidence that we're gonna come back to you in May with a very detailed uh, presentation is because Dr. Guest is gonna lead us through this. Uh, Hatton and I have decided that we uh, we appointed uh, Elise to lead our little crew because she's very experienced, lots of background, um, and she's done this for a living day in and day out in her daily work. So I'm about to turn it over to Dr. Guest, and she's going to uh, present to you in a more specific fashion the things that we are planning to do. And we hope when we're done tonight that we've given you a very quick overview, but a, a, 
thorough overview of what we plan to do and you come away with the idea of how we are approaching this. What's interesting is it's not just the IB initiative. We want to develop a template that we can use for all the initiatives that are in the district. So after we go through our uh, international baccalaureate review, which will take a few months, then there's lots of other initiatives under our previous strategic plan that we'd like to look at. And the key word we're looking at is impact. What impact did the program have? Was it successful? Uh, and it's really gonna be critical that we tie that into our new strategic plan and the visions that come out of uh, that, which is taking place kind of parallel to this, to our little group. So uh, Dr. Guest, Elise, uh, I'm turning it over to you and you can walk uh, the board through specifically what we plan to do. Thank you for that introduction. Um, just to underscore what Russ just spoke to is our, as our, we're, we're really trying to do is to develop um, a process that we can replicate across a wide variety of different initiatives, recognizing that we want to capture a multitude of different input and data sources, a wide variety of stakeholders, recognizing that we each have you know, personal connections to these initiatives and biases and, and putting all that input together to make some really good decisions for our school district. And so this all first begins with these three essential questions you see before you. And the first one is really looking at how we met the goals of the previous strategic plan around the achievement for all plan. And the outcomes around that achievement for all plan were measured by two sources. One was an increase on student engagement. So the level of participation, the level of engagement of students either taking an IB course or um, accessing the IB diploma. And then secondly, just the development and the application of 21st century critical skills, such as communication, collaboration, and critical thinking. And while this strategic plan, you know, helped guide our school district for the last 10 years across a multitude of superintendents, it allowed for us to be innovative and creative and really thoughtful about our school district. We see this achievement plan starting to sunset. And so in looking ahead at the needs of our current students and where the vision of our school district is leading, we need to start focusing on more of the accessibility of students to, with these initiatives and that opportunity for participation. Um, I think one thing that we've really learned through COVID is, is that notion of how do we ensure that all kids have that accessibility for strong instruction and engagement with their peers and so forth. And so these second questions will really help guide not only the review process, but a lot of what we anticipate will come forth in our next strategic plan. So thinking of those words like accessibility and opportunity really helps to provide that lens around equity. And so in thinking about that, we can take these three questions and put it into play in a multiple kind of process of, that's um, guided by improvement science. And this process is something that we use in curriculum instruction department time and time again when adopting and implementing curriculum or an initiative. So implementation science is, is definitely a framework, a research-based framework that gives you stages on how to implement something into sustainable measures, something that is scaled up across a system. We've seen it used in, um, in health industry as well as in public education. And for this specific piece to reviewing an initiative, we're really looking at that last measure of that continuous improvement, regeneration, and evaluation of our initiative. Did the initiative allow us to meet the outcomes that we set forth? Are there certain current practices that are working or not working for our system? It allows us to really look at a wide variety of data sources and to determine whether this initiative is continuing to work for us or if we need to shift our area of focus. And so we use this multiple stages um, of implementation that is research-based and really can help guide us to keep us focused on the task at hand and making sure that we're being really thoughtful about whether or not to, to continue an initiative, make modifications and so forth based on what the needs of our, our system, our students are saying. And so when we think specifically about that data, we're thinking about four different data sources. And it's really important to think about the wide variety of data sources, both qualitative and quantitative. 
So that first one you see there is around local data, specifically financial data. In thinking about some of these initiatives like IB, there's been a wide variety of um, financial resources, whether it's from the general fund in the school district or from the generosity of the Washington Foundation in a grant that was called SHAPE and now most recently 21st Century Teaching and Learning. Um, it's also really important to, to look at the staff and student outcomes. Pedagogically, did, did our staff really um, enhance their instruction in the ways in which they meet the needs of our students? And for learning, did, did students really achieve and engage in that learning in a new and um, innovative way that really meets the needs of our current state? And the second piece is around that user voice. Empathy interviews is a key part to all of this implementation science work. And you actually heard about this in the last meeting when we talked to you about our new faculty um, program that used empathy interviews to help develop our new faculty program. So empathy interviews is a great way to really have key important conversations with those people who are directly involved with the initiative and they can talk about the barriers and successes and really give that user insight that can only be captured in that type of a conversation. Um, the second piece is obviously through surveys and focus groups of other key stakeholders, whether it be students or families that we may not be able to capture in, in the previous ways through an interview. Then there's always the practical expertise. We really want to honor all of the key stakeholders across MCP and MCPS staff that have like really dug in, who are looking at the data, and together we'll make a recommendation to the superintendent and then therefore to the school board. And last, there's always that scholarly expertise. We are very lucky and graced to have a strong partnership with the University of Montana and the Phyllis J. Washington College of Education, who's been our partner in many of these initiatives. We also have um, a key understanding of what the national organizations require of us and what, they're, what we are allowed and not allowed to do. So looking to national organizations like IBO to make sure that we are kept in line with their expectations, policies, and practices. And of course, the Washington Foundation that has been so um, critical in helping us to initiate and put into full implementation some of these initiatives and are also excited and interested in carrying the conversation forward into what needs to happen next to help fulfill the needs of our school district. So with these four data sources, I think it's important to underscore the qualitative and quantitative piece that helps to really inform this process and make sure that we're really gathering all the right information to make an informed um, recommendation. And so in thinking about this, we, we really wanted to put this forth into a timeline that shows you um, the speed of which we want to review initiatives, um, but also where in which we need to be responsible to, to sharing out information to our stakeholders and making sure we're true to the process at hand. So all of this, as, as Russ spoke earlier, started back in November when we began to really think about the scope and sequence of this review process, how it fits in line with many of the curriculum adoptions and implementations we've already done, and how this is just that last step of, of really reviewing and acknowledging what we've done and regenerating it towards what will best meet the needs of our district moving forward. That data collection also began as we started to refine what the data was going to look like and how we were going to illustrate it so that we could begin to use it and sharing it with other stakeholders. Um, from there, I would point out that after this conversation with the board this evening, um, Russ and I have a huge task of beginning those empathy interviews and reaching out to all of our schools who are um, considered IB schools and seeking staff to, to participate in the empathy interviews. At the same time, we'll begin to look for members to apply to be a part of a task force that'll then be gathering this information and evaluating it towards recommendation. The task force will continue into March and will then layer on the essence of, um, of initiating focus groups to ensure that we capture that voice from our students and our families. And then lastly, by the end of April and into May, we will be coming back to the superintendent and to the Board of Trustees for not only the recommendation, but announcement of how the review process worked, what things we need to um, capture, and, and where we need to move forward from there. 
So it's a pretty aggressive timeline, but I think it, it reflects our commitment and dedication to, to a, a strong um, review process that we can replicate, whether it's looking at IB or any other initiative that will help us in informing our next strategic plan and also thinking about how we best meet the needs of our, our community. So that was a quick overlook, and I, I definitely um, ask Hatton and Russ to add anything I may have forgotten from our conversations and our collaboration, and also any questions that the Board of Trustees may have. Hatton, <clears throat> excuse me, I apologize. I actually had folded accidentally in my agenda a little crease at the bottom, and I totally covered your name up. So I missed that you're part of this presentation. So please go ahead um, with any comments you'd like to add. Oh, thank you very much. I think the only thing I would highlight is just that we will largely get student and parent voice via focus groups. So we'll, rather than doing one-on-one -on -one interviews with those groups, we'll be doing focus groups. And yeah. I will likely be conducting those, but to maintain the validity, uh, Russ, Elise, and I will be looking for the themes across all empathy interviews and focus groups before we give that to the task force. Thank you for adding that, Hatton. Absolutely, that's very important. And with that, I'll, I see Trustee Decker's about to raise her hand. So go ahead and raise it, and then I'll look to see um, if Hatton can identify people in the boardroom, and I'll continue to look for virtual hands raised. So Trustee Decker first and then I'll check back with Hatton. Thanks. Um, I'm excited to see the results of this process and thank you for designing um, out a process that could be kind of laid out and communicated so clearly, um, gives lots and lots of checkpoints and and um, lots and lots of information that we can look forward to to get a really quantitative and qualitative look at the whole, um, the whole program. So that's really exciting. So thank you for that. I am curious about two little components, one being um, how you're planning to find people to participate in empathy interviews and how, um, because you know there are, there are folks who typically become aware of these opportunities and raise their hand to give their input. And we know across the district that those vo like certain voices are often louder than others. And so we wanna make sure that we're asking people who don't always have that opportunity. And related maybe is, while we're um, assessing the opinions and perspectives of people who've had the opportunity to participate in IB, it's also really important to maybe get some take from people who have not, um, and people who have been part of programs that you know did not adopt IB or were, were around it, what the perspective is, especially in terms of equity from people who have not been on the inside of that program. Just if we're really looking at a 360 view, we might wanna Make sure. So that's, I guess, a, a comment-ish question. My question is, how are you going to solicit input? That's my question. Well, that's an easy one. We, we could do that one first. Um, so I think that's a really important question. And I, I appreciate the thought around that question being that how do we make sure to involve those who, who may not always get shoulder tapped to, to join in the conversation or are the first ones to confidently raise their hand? And so after this, we do have a plan of um, of working with each school and we have a Google form that um, allows people to to answer and say, yes, I'm, I'm interested in giving an empathy interview or I'm not able to right now, but I, I want to or no, thank you, I can opt out. And then from there, acknowledging that um, there is a window between February and March to schedule those interviews. And, and to share that time with the person that's choosing to do so. So we're hoping to send out that Google form to each building, making sure to capture any staff members, classified, certified, whomever, who are interested in participating in that. And I think one thing that's important with that is that these interviews are confidential. That even after Hatton, um, Russ and I look at them and find the themes and present those to the task force, that we will not be presenting individuals' um, responses and thoughts around the interviews, but more so um, their input in the in the total themes. And we saw that really benefit um, when we were developing the new faculty program and how to support 
um, our new faculty is recognizing those that did get the support and those who didn't and, and how that worked. And so your second point of, of making sure to get that full 360 view is, is important. And it's something that we did discuss and are grappling with, with how to best do that in a way that um, is thoughtful and is inclusive for sure. I think that's also where some of our focus groups can come from too that Hatton spoke about. Thank you, Grace, for asking those questions. Trustee Lorenzen? Yeah, I, I, Trustee Lorenzen? Yeah. Um, I think my question is similar to Grace's, maybe more direct. Um, because of the amount of money that IB costs, there's lost opportunity. And so I would just caution you, don't just talk to those that benefited, but try to imagine what could have been done had that money been available for other purposes. Um, and similarly, um, because I was here when it first started, try to have a control, or I guess a question, right? <laughs> Will you have a control group? For example, if, if you say, this is what IB kindergarten looks like, and all the other eight schools go, yeah, that's what our kindergarten looks like too. Um, that's what was missing before. It was sort of, it was, it was sort of compared to, to, to nothing, <laughs> as if nobody else was doing anything. So I guess, uh, are, are you gonna capture comparative experience and have some control groups to see how is it different from what the other schools are doing, not simply why is it good? Yes, I, I think that's an important piece and, and it's something that Russ and Hatton and I can take back as feedback and make sure that um, that is definitely embedded into this process. Any of <coughs> Trust Excuse me, any other trustee questions? There are two in the room, Trustee Mercer and Trustee Sturbis. Sure, Trustee Mercer first and then Trustee Sturbis second. And then I, I had a question too. So go ahead, Trustee Mercer. Yeah, a little bit repetitive of the same prior questions in that I can understand how you can look at an individual thing and decide how to make it better. But I get a sense here, there's sort of an up, down, expand, not expand. And I don't know how you do that without knowing, comparing it to alternatives not just not it, but some other alternative. It doesn't make any sense. I don't know how you, I can see making something better. How do you say whether we should expand or retract something without knowing, without comparing it qualitatively to the alternative? I yeah. don't I, know if Russ <laughs> or Hatton or Elise or Dr. Watson. Yes, I'll, I'll weigh in and I know um, Elise or Hatton or Russ could also give you their perspective. I, I think um, Trustee Mercer, part of the reason that, that we're heading down this road is if you look at our strategic plan 10 years ago, we set out specific goals and outcomes for these initiatives. And when we start making changes to these initiatives or recommending you know, using um, resources in a different way. One of the questions I had is, did we meet the goals for the initiative that were set out originally? And I think that if we can answer that question through this process, I think that'll help guide our decisions with how we spend our resources. And then Trustee Sturbus. Um, I was wondering if uh, there'd be a way that you can look at um, how this IB program has affected students going to college. Um, because, you know, at Big Sky, when my daughters were there, it was AP, it wasn't IB. And so I was just kind of curious if you're gonna look at how they compare to AP classes. That's a great question. And, and we've talked um, quite a bit about what data sources we can collect around oh. students. Um, the initiative outcomes were around student engagement. So much of the data that we collected mostly to give reports for um, the SHAPE grant and then the 21st Century Teach and Learning grant was around participation, like how many students took an IB course, how many students took more than one IB courses, uh, how many students were candidates for the diploma, how many finished the diploma. Um, but we didn't capture that next level of data over the years as far as did earning the IB diploma um, give access to X amount of credits in college or entry into this college over another? Um, so that part of the data is a little bit more complicated to gather. 
we did think about trying to reach out to past graduates and what that would look like and that that became very complicated quickly um so it, it's difficult to gather that that piece of information any other um questions from trustees in the boardroom i don't see any hands up virtually um trustee vogel i didn't know if you had any questions so just let me know if you do so I, I do have a question which is somewhat related, I think a little bit to the same question that Trustee Lorenzen and Trustee Mercer asked. But at some point in the process, will there be some kind of, I don't know what the right term is, synergistic evaluation in the sense that how many kids took AP versus IB classes where both were offered? How many kids, for example, at Big Sky took um, Health and Science Academy were in that initiative and were also in the IB program there. And, you know, do you ask students, say, at either Sentinel or Big Sky, at Sentinel would be, would you have wished to have an IB class or two there? Or at Big Sky, do you wish you'd have an AP class there? So I guess it's somewhat related to their two questions is at, at some point, how does how do you come forward with recommendations and how does the board make decisions about how to weigh the strengths and weaknesses of the various programs? Because we do have limited resources financially, teacher-wise, administratively. So I just, you know, is that kind of, I'm looking toward the end product of what this journey is going to accomplish. So I didn't know if anyone had an answer or some thoughts on that. Chair Holland, I'll try. <laughs> Um, you know, we really appreciate the feedback of that kind of question. We've now heard it about three times from uh, phrased different ways. So uh, our, our goal in our coming weeks here will be to include that into our conversations of how we might be able to get at that kind of data in a relatively short period of time. Um, it will be probably be a bit of a challenge, but uh, we'll certainly consider that. I, we don't have that answer for you right now, but um, it will be in our conversations here soon. We'll see what we can do. Thank you for that answer. I, I just, well, I can make my comments after we finish up with um, any more questions. Any other trustees have a question? I'm not seeing any indications. And so since this was information only now, I would take any trustee discussion or comments, and then we'll check to see if there's any public comment. Any comments from trustees? <coughs> I don't see any in the room. So I'll go ahead and make a comment. Notwithstanding my last question, I appreciate the thoughtfulness and the thoroughness with which you've um, come up with a vetting process to make these kinds of evaluations. And I guess the only thing I'm encouraging is at the end, there's some kind of overarching vetting process that will give some added value for any board decision that we might be making, or even just hearing the administrative decisions that might be made, because this is probably more an administrative decision. But I really wanna thank you and Russ and Hatton and appreciate that the detail and the thoughtfulness of the process itself is, I'm very impressed. I just hope there's one final step at the end. But anyway, so that's my comment. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you so much for your feedback. You've given us some good things to think about. Any other board comment? Okay, not seeing any hands up. I want to thank um, you all three for being there, although often you're there anyway. But I thank you for, for um, doing the background work to do this presentation to us as well, just to explain what you've been working on. And so thank you. Then we move on to B1, which is to approve resolution 2021. Uh, may I make one brief public comment? I simply want to add a correction that I wasn't able to insert at the last board meeting. We introduced people who are a part of our I-Value Committee and Developmental Work, and I overlooked Dr. Elise Guest in that introduction, and I want to acknowledge her great contribution for the past year and a half to that work. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment on this information item? 
And thank you for the reminder hat and I sure appreciate it. Okay, with that being said, let me grab my agenda. Now we move on to finance operations and maintenance. The first item, which is to approve resolution 2021E in support of the city's grant application to the Land and Water Conservation Fund program for improvements to the Lowell Playground at Westside Park. As board members will recall, we um, discussed this on January 26th. And I think both Trustee Mercer and my, uh, myself had some questions about some of the language. And so we agreed to table it and allow Pat to take a second look at it. So Pat, if you wanna explain, um, now it comes before us as an action item again, so. Uh, thank you, Chair Holland. Uh, yeah, so we, uh, the board looked at the uh, extensive background regarding this agenda item uh, two weeks ago. The, uh, as mentioned, the request or the grant application is submitted by the city of Missoula. Um, the parks department, um, as the department of the city of Missoula, uh, leases the uh, Westside Park playground um, from uh, the school district. And so the, uh, uh, and the, as the lessee of that portion of the, of the property owned by the school district, the, uh, the city has the um, right and is in the process of improving the playground. The playground had uh, um, operated with a wooden structure that's been there for about 20 years that's deteriorated and um, the parks department along with MCPS and the uh, other groups and organizations, including the North Missoula Community Development Corporation are in the process of fundraising to make improvements to, to that park and that playground. Um, uh, the, the improvements would be in, 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 uh, um, in, in alignment with the uh, Westside Park Master Plan, which was also developed in collaboration with the city and MCPS. The uh, grant application is through the Land Water Conservation Fund. This uh, grant is administered by the Montana Department of Fish and uh, Wildlife. The grants are typically in total about a million, a 1.5 to 2 million uh, uh, authorized during the year for outdoor recreation, uh, two cities, two counties, two school districts. And, uh, and here, um, we would, uh, as, or the, the request is uh, supporting the grant application. Um, and uh, as part of the grant application, uh, awardees uh, would be asked to commit to outdoor recreation um, um, for the site that's, that's identified to be improved um, in perpetuity and that the, uh, the area improved would, would not be uh, encroached other than to support outdoor recreation. And, and that limitation or, or uh, constraint is identified in some of the background information. Uh, I'll, I'll direct you to page 24, which is a, uh, a map that we looked at uh, previously regarding the, the area, um, the uh, bottom half of page 24 is includes the, the school building. This is an old map, but it's attached to our, our lease and is the best reflection of the, the property. And, and uh, um, this, the upper half of that map of the property is, is the area to be improved. And um, it's hard to see the lines, but there's, there's a bit of a, a jag around the partnership health center, which wouldn't be part of the improved property, but the remainder of that that area would be improved. Uh, that runs really from the, the asphalt court, um, uh, and that's, that's actually heading east, but uh, um, up on your page to include all of the, uh, the park area. Um, the, uh, the resolution, as Chair Holland mentioned, um, includes some uh, background uh, regarding the, the lease, the 30 year lease between the city and the school district. Um, it includes uh, information regarding the grant program itself, uh, including the constraints that I just talked about. And then the uh, uh, resolution 
uh, or the declaration itself that uh, that would support the and better uh, the the, uh, the resolution to better serve the needs of Lowell students, residents, neighbors, and community. MCPS sources supports the City of Missoula making application for an LWCF grant for the Westside Park project, and further that the board acknowledges the grant requirements and uh, expects the rights and responsibilities outlined in the lease agreement to continue in full force and effect, which was an item that was referenced during our, our last meeting. Um, the, uh, the lease agreement, which isn't attached, uh, is a 30-year lease agreement, and it does include um, expectations that the parties will, will um, use the park area as uh, in a collaborative way and for for us, the, the playground area would be used exclusively by our students during the school day and also in support of our, uh, um, our school programs. And um, also included in the lease agreement is the uh, opportunity and ability to construct a fence that would create this sort of uh, protective security barrier between the park area and, and the playground. So with that, I would, I would entertain any any questions um, that you might have and, <clears throat> excuse me could you identify um, I think there were some changes after the perpetuity questions that trustee Mercer and I asked I, I don't know if you highlighted that change which is in the proposed document and if you did I apologize no problem and happy to so so first of all the uh, um, the uh, the reference on page 28 of the resolution it uh, it reflects the uh, the expectation of the board that the rights and responsibilities of the lease agreement would continue in full force and effect. Um, the other piece was uh, is in the reflected in the whereas clause that's also on page 28. The top whereas clause um, restates the the part of the law that allows for the, um, the, the substitution of the property. It's, it's uh, uh, the citation is to 36 CFR 59.3. And part of the, the, the as mentioned, the, the grant requires the continuation of the property in perpetuity, uh, in perpetuity as a out for outdoor use, but it also allows conversion of the property. And, uh, and that's that's contained within within that that law that's that's cited and connected to this grant application. So uh, the property can be converted um, if the National Park Service approves a substitution property of equivalent uh, of substantial or reasonably equivalent usefulness and location and of at least equal fair market value. So um, that that is an opportunity. It's it's uh, um, it's um, it's available uh, under the grant, but but um, uh, as mentioned within that whereas clause, that the uh, the the requirements of the grant are intended to ensure the area is is maintained and con con uh, continually for outdoor recreation purposes. Uh, so hopefully, that, Chair that Holland, that answers your question. In response to our questions from last meeting, those were in response to the questions raised last meeting. Yes. Okay, I just wanted to make kind of make it clear why it's coming back with that modification. Any questions for Pat? I'll look for hands. And Hatton, if you can let me know if there's any hands raised in the boardroom. Trustee Mercer has his hand raised. Sure, Trustee Mercer, go ahead. Just to be super clear, everything west of the north-south sidewalk, we can continue to do whatever we want with, right? It is in no way encumbered. That's correct. So you're looking at the uh, the the um, and again the probably the better diagram to look at would be on page 30. And so on page 30, you can see the the school building, the new school building, and uh, and so the the if you overlay the exhibit A, which is part of the lease agreement, um, then you would have the the property that's part of the, that would include the sport court, the court that's there that would be included in that playground area and would exclude the Partnership Health Center. The grassy field would 
not be included or be part of that that area. Does that help answer your question, Trustee Mercer? Yes, thank you. Any other questions for Pat? I don't see any in the any room. Pardon? I apologize, I don't see any in the room. Okay, thanks. <coughs> and so the recommendation, <coughs> excuse me, just trying to get to the bottom. The recommendation is that there is a motion to approve resolution 2021-3E if trustees support the city's application for an LWCF, which stands, it's in the background information, I believe, um, land and water conservation fund program as outlined above. Is there a motion to approve resolution 2021-3E from a K-12 trustee? So moved if nobody else did. Okay, Trustee Decker, and is there a second? Second. Trustee Lorenzen seconded. Okay, is there any board discussion? I don't see any in the room. I'll just make a comment. Thank you, Pat, for taking a second look at the agreement. I, I think it's a little bit um, more viable legally in its revised form. And I think this is a really good opportunity for this partnership between Lowell School and the city. So thank you for doing that additional diligence so that this could move forward. I really appreciate that since it seems like it's a very valuable opportunity for Lowell and Westside Park. Any public comment? Anyone wants to raise your virtual hand? Or if you're on the phone, I don't think anyone's on the phone, unmute yourself. Um, it's time now for public comment. Not seeing any hands raised. So again, this is um, a vote by the K-12 trustees. All K-12 trustees in favor of the motion to approve resolution 2021-4E, please indicate by raising your hands and a patent you can indicate those in the boardroom and I see the trustee McDonald and trustee um, Decker have raised their hands virtually and then if you can let me know those in the boardroom or have their hands raised. Trustee Mercer, trustee old person, trustee Lorenzen, trustee Abgaris and trustee Hobbins. And I just noticed that trustee McDonald, she's just kind of fallen off my screen but she also has voted yes. So if I didn't say her ahead of time, I apologize, Trustee McDonald. And so that motion passes unanimously as to all K-12 trustees present. Then we move to topics three, two, three, four, and five, which we see this time of year. They're parallel um, action items. One is elementary school trustees, one is high school trustees, one is elementary general fund levies and one is high school general fund levies. And it is asking for board approval to call for school board elections in these four areas. So Pat, if you wanna walk us through B2, which is school elections for elementary school trustees. And re if you don't mind reminding um, anyone who might be watching this meeting or looking at the minutes, um, what the qualifications are for someone to run for those two spots uh, as a trustee. So I'll turn it over to you, Pat, for B2, and then I think some of the con conversations will become um, a little bit more redundant or parallel. You bet. Thank you, uh, Chair Holland. So as mentioned, these are our uh, this time of year resolutions uh, as uh, elections would be held, trustee elections must be held on May 4th uh, this year. And this first item is on the elementary side and the resolution is attached at page 31. Um, there are two trustee positions that are open. Uh, both are for three year terms. Um, the election per agreement with the elections office would be held by mail ballot election. Um, as referenced on the resolution, the the last declaration indicates that there was uh, reserved authority with the superintendent or superintendent's designee to cancel the election in accordance with the reference statutes if it's not uh, necessary to be held. And, and 
that was the case last year when the number of candidates was equal to the number of open positions. So the election was declared by acclamation and, and, and canceled. Um, at this point, uh, the uh, trustees or, or candidates wishing to um, uh, file for the election have till March 25th to do so. Um, the uh, candidates uh, for these positions um, must live in the elementary district, which would include the urban center of, the, of uh, Missoula, um, uh, then excluding, so anywhere where uh, our elementary school buildings are um, uh, serve residents uh, um, and where, uh, where um, uh, so, so candidates would have to live in the residents that serve those uh, school districts. Uh, the elementary school districts and uh, middle school districts, the um, uh, and be uh, registered to vote in uh, uh, Missoula. The um, application can be picked up at uh, my office. It's also av available on the website and uh, can be submitted directly to my office uh, for any candidates wishing to apply. Um, uh, and that's uh, all I had to share. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer. At least Zoom tells me when I'm muted. Thank you, Zoom. Any questions from any trustees? I don't Not see any in any the room. Indications. Any indication in the boardroom, Pat? No, ma'am. Okay. And so the recommendation um, is that there is a motion to approve Resolution 2021-4E, which is a call for school election for elementary school trustees. Is there such a motion? So moved. And it looks like Trustee McDonald has seconded it. Is there any board discussion? Not seeing any hands up. Any public comment? Not seen any hands in the queue. So all K-12 trustees in favor of the motion to approve resolution 2021-4E, please indicate by raising your hand. That's trustee McDonald and trustee Decker virtually. And Hatton, if you can let me know in the boardroom. Yes, trustee, to... trustee Mercer, trustee Old Person, trustee Lorenzen, trustee Abgaris, and trustee Hobbins. Thanks. So that motion passes unanimously. That I think I called for public comment. Did I, Tracy, or let me know if I need to go back and do that? Yes, you did. Okay, thank you. And then we move on to B3, which is to approve the call, or a call for school election for high school trustees in districts B and C. So Pat, if you just wanna highlight the difference between this resolution, which is 2021-5S, and you know, as compared to what we just or what um, was just voted on. You bet. Thank you, Chair Holland. So, for the uh, this resolution, resolution is for the high school district, and the resolution is found on page 32. And this year, uh, positions are open in districts B and and C. And as referenced in the background section. Um, the uh, el uh, election district B includes the attendance area of Bonner and Target Range. And then the election district C includes the attendance area of Hellgate Elementary. Um, like the elementary election, this election will be held on May 4th, uh, 2021. And the deadline for candidates to file is March 25th. And, and obviously candidates for these uh, seats should live in the uh, uh, election districts that are that were just referenced. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions of Pat concerning this um, proposed resolution? I'm not seeing any hands up. Is there a motion to approve resolution 2021-5S? Oh, moved by Trustee Wake, is there a second? Trustee Sturbis. And seconded by Trustee Sturbis. Is there any board discussion? Is there any public comment? 
seeing none. All those in favor, and this is everyone can vote, every trustee can vote a motion is um, all those trustees in favor of the motion to approve resolution 2021-5S, please indicate by saying yes or raising your hand. Hall, Chair, Trustee Holland is a yes, and Trustee McDonald has her hand up and Trustee Decker has her hand up. And then in the boardroom, Captain? Vogel is a yes. Oh, thanks, Trustee Vogel. I'm so sorry. Trustee Mercer, Trustee Sturbis, Trustee Old Person, Trustee Lorenzen, Trustee Abgaris, and Trustee Hobbins. So that motion passes unanimously. And then Pat, I think you can provide background information on the next two agenda items, even though one is for an elementary levy and one is for a high school levy, but the explanation as to the process as to whether or not to hold an election for a general fund levy is probably pretty similar. Is that, would that be an accurate statement? Yes, that is an accurate statement. Thanks, Chair Holland. So the uh, next two resolutions as mentioned are for the general fund levy election. The elementary is identified or listed on page 33 and the high school resolution on page 34. Um, these uh, resolutions are placeholders for a potential levy election. Um, we'll have an opportunity now that we've uh, just about completed our second enrollment count to talk with the board about what these levies could look like. Um, and uh, for the benefit of um, uh, new trustees, the, the school funding formula provides for really a calculation of what the over base levy election could be and that calculation is based uh, almost exclusively on the enrollment counts that we do, that we perform in October and February. So um, this becomes a placeholder. It isn't the, uh, doesn't mean that a levy, levy election will be held. The uh, levy amount has to be adopted and identified by the board um, by April 2nd. Um, last year we did not run a levy election in either district, the elementary or the high school district. Um, I, I think it's uh, fair to say that, that um, Superintendent Watson and myself will, will make every effort to figure out a way not to run a levy election, but um, that doesn't mean that uh, other things change and circumstances change. But um, so hopefully when we meet next February or next meeting, we'll have some data that we can share to identify what the levy would, would look like or could look like. And we'll talk about uh, um, options and ways that we might be able to, uh, to balance our budget without running an operating levy. So uh, with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Pat? So I, I just have a question to clarify. So each year the board considers and must by statute considers um, adopting a resolution that would call for a school election for levies at the elementary and high school level. That doesn't require the board to run any levies. It is required by statute, however, that we at least indicate that that may be an option and that decision will be made at a later date once you and, and Dr. Watson have determined whether it's you know, necessary to run a levy since the preference is to not do not to do so. Is that accurate? Did I say it kind of in a different way? No, that 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 is accurate. And I would just add to that that um, the school funding formula might dictate that a, a levy wouldn't even be available just because oh. of how uh, uh, how the fun, funding formula works. So I would just only I would add that uh, that to what you had said, Chair Holland. Yeah, thank you for that clarification. I hadn't realized that. Thanks so much. Any other questions of Pat or Dr. Watson? Seeing none, then the first number four is that there is a motion to approve resolution 2021-5E. Is there a motion from a K-12 trustee to do so? Trustee Old Person. Okay, thanks Trustee Old Person. Is there a second? Trustee Hobbins. Thanks Trustee Hobbins. Now, that's, now it's time for board discussion. Any board discussion? Are there any hands up in the boardroom? I'm not seeing any virtually. 
There are no hands in the room. Okay. Any public comment? I'm not seeing any hands being raised virtually. And so all K-12 trustees in favor of the motion to approve resolution 2021-5E, please indicate by raising your hand or saying aye. And Trustee McDonald and Trustee Decker have their hands raised virtually. Trustee Mercer, Trustee Oldperson, Trustee Lorenzen, Trustee Abgaris, and Trustee Hobbins. Thanks, so that motion passes unanimously. And then we move on to number five. Um, Pat, is there anything you'd want to add to the recommendation to approve a resolution 21, 2021-6S, which would call for a school election for the high school general fund levy? Um, nothing to add, thank you. Okay, any questions of Pat? Not seeing any hands going up. So is there a motion to approve resolution 2021-6S? Trustee Hobbins. And seconded by Trustee Wake. So Trustee Hobbins has moved and Trustee Wake has seconded the motion to approve resolution 2021-6S. Is there any board discussion? Not seeing any hands raised and I don't see Trustee Vogel um, unmuting herself. And is there any board or public comment? Seeing no hands being raised, then all trustees in favor of the motion to approve resolution 2021-6S, please raise your hand or say yes. And so Holland is a yes. Trustee McDonald and Trustee Decker have hands raised. Trustee Mercer. Bogle. Bogle Thank is yes. Thank you, Trustee Bogle. And Hatton in the boardroom. Trustee Mercer, Trustee Sturbis, Trustee Oldperson, Trustee Lorenzen, Trustee Abgaris, and Trustee Hobbins. So that motion passes unanimously. Then, oops, I'm sorry, I put the wrong way in my agenda. We'll now move on to board policies um, under personnel negotiations and policy. And there is a recommend, there is a recommendation to approve the first reading of board policy 1905, face coverings as personal protective equipment. And as you'll recall, all policies that fall under the 1900 series are emergency policies, um, oddly or perhaps appropriately designated as 1900 series because they're related to COVID-19 and, and situations that have arisen in the pandemic. And so trustee, um, I'm sorry, Dr. Watson, I know that you and I talked about one modification to be made to the policy that we thought it had been made and we caught that it hadn't yet been today. But other than noting that, do you want to go ahead and just generally explain um, the basis for making this recommendation for this policy? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair Holland. The administration would like to recommend to the board um, that, that, you, uh, that we adopt the policy on first reading. Just to remember, remember that their uh, policy takes two readings. So it's important to note that um, the policy as it stands will be put out for public comment and then would be brought back in front of the board for that second reading. Uh, the, as Chair Holland pointed out, last April, the board uh, declared a state of emergency as related to the pandemic. Once the board did that, that, that allowed us to access quite a few of the 1900 policies that were drafted by the Montana School Boards Association. So for example, we were able to dra uh, adopt a policy that allowed us to provide academic waivers for our high school seniors last year. That was one of the 1900 policies. This, this one in addition, as I said, was drafted by the Montana School Boards Association. I also had our um, local attorney take a look at it and she made a couple of minor suggested changes. Um, part of the reason that we're suggesting the adoption of this policy is we, we do wanna make it clear that face coverings are a key mitigation strategy. And um, we, we've seen that time and again in, in several guidance documents that talk about reopening schools. Um, nearly every document talks about the importance of face coverings. So we believe that this policy needs, needs to be adopted so that we're clear with 
with our students and our staff and, and more importantly with our community that might be visiting our buildings that when, when you come into a building, we do require face coverings. The policy would stay in effect as an emergency policy as long as the board um, has maintained that we're still under that declaration of emergency. If we ever get to a point where we lift that declaration of emergency, then all of the 1900 policies, we would either have to carry them forward or they would sunset after that emergency declaration has been lifted. Uh, just one correction I want to make um, in the uh, in the policy that um, that I forgot to correct when I first saw it. And I, so I just want to make sure I would I would propose the policy be adopted with this one correction. So if you take a look at the policy on page 35 and um, the third paragraph that starts right before the the numbered list starts with student staff volunteers and visitors are not required to wear a mask or face shield. It actually should say a mask or face covering, not face shield, but face covering under this provision. So that's the only slight change that I would recommend. And um, other than that, I would just answer any questions that the board might have. Does anyone have any questions of Dr. Watson on the proposed policy 1900? Um, let me get the specific. Um, I'm not seeing the number on the policy itself, so let me go back to the agenda. Sorry, Chair Holland, it's 1905. 1905. Any questions? Trustee Mercer. Trustee Mercer, go ahead. Thanks. Two <coughs> brief questions regarding the first line of the second paragraph. Um, it just says wear a face covering. Elsewhere, you specify that a face covering covers the face or the nose and mouth, do you want to specify in where that it also must cover, be worn in a way that covers the nose? Just, and that's sort of a reoccurring problem. Um, and then I take it with the vaccine status that you, I mean, I believe the mask would be some impediment to perhaps speaking for teachers and stuff, but you think it's still worth it even if the teacher is documented vaccinated yeah, so uh, good question. I, I tried to clean this up as much as possible, and, and I understand that face covering is defined in a couple of different places. I, I would want to point the board to um, the last sentence of the first paragraph. We understand that face coverings will be further modified and defined. You've heard recently the recommendations to wear, you know, a face covering with double layers in it. So that's a recent recommendation. What we're going to do is outline in our procedures exactly what a face covering is and define it fairly clearly in our, in our procedures. And the reason we're gonna do it in procedures is as the, rec as the recommendations change over time, then we, we can change our procedures more quickly and not have to come back before the board to change a procedure. For, so for example, if at some point in time, you know, the face shields become an appropriate face covering, then we could change that in our procedures and, and sort of adapt to that. So um, where it says face covering means a disposable or reusable mask that cover the nose and mouth, that's a definition of face coverings that, um, that should be consistent but also placed in procedures so then it's really clear what a face covering is. And, and then to the second question, I would just say that um, you know, at some point in time, we, we do hope that our staff is vaccinated, hopefully sooner rather than later. Um, we understand that that's gonna provide a, a certain layer of protection for our staff. Um, however, um, the vaccinations for children um, look, look to be further out on the horizon. And so, you know, because our staff is protected and, and would be less transmission to our staff, but there still could be a potential for transmission between students. And so that's why we believe that this face covering policy is so critical, is that until everyone receives that vaccination or, or some sort of protection in that way, then we believe face coverings are still gonna be important. Are there any other questions of Dr. Watson from trustees? Not seeing hands up. <coughs> um, for those participating virtually. Are there any hands up in the boardroom? No, there are not. Okay. So let me get back. I'm just 
flipping back to the agenda item, I was just looking at the policy itself. One second. And so, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, the recommendation is that there is a motion to approve the first reading of board policy 1905, which is titled face coverings and personal protective equipment and to authorize the posting of the proposed um, board policy for public comment with the understanding that face shields, um, the word shields would be modified to read face coverings. Is there a motion from any trustee? I see trustee. Wake had her hand up first, so Trustee Wake has made a motion and has so moved, and Trustee Decker had her hand up, so she, I just saw one hand a little more quickly than the other, so Trustee Decker has seconded the motion. Is there any board discussion? I don't see any in the room. And I don't see any um, virtually. just want to um, thank Dr. Watson and the MTSPA and working with our local attorneys um, to create this policy right now because it seems like it's a good policy to have an effect. And I appreciate <clears throat> that the details more appropriately fit in procedures that are developed under the policy. So thank you for also considering that. Any public comment? Um, let me, oh, Casey Ballou, first you were undefined. So Ms. Ballou, go ahead. <laughs> Casey Ballou, K-A capital C, two small E, B-A-L-L-O-U, president of the Missoula EA. Um, I just wanna say that this has been a big cause of concern for our staff members as we try to distance, you know, 28 kids in a room and know it's not possible. And as we try to layer those mitigation strategies. So just making sure that we are in control of that mask policy. Um, will be definitely a, a reason to sigh with some relief. So thanks. Thanks. Any other public comment? I'm not seeing any hands going up at this point. And so we have a seconded motion um, to approve the first reading of board policy 1905 and authorize its posting for public comment. All trustees in favor of the motion, please indicate by raising your hands or saying yes or aye. Trustee Holland votes yes. yes. Vogel is yes. Trustee Decker and Trustee Wake. And I I can see Trustee McDonald's in the meeting, but she hasn't voted yet virtually or by raising her hand. Oh, her hand just went up. So Trustee McDonald has voted yes. And then Hatton, if you can indicate um, whether how the trustees are voting in the boardroom. Trustee Mercer, Trustee Sturbis, Trustee Oldperson, Trustee Lorenzen, Trustee Avgaris, and Trustee Hobbins all vote yes. Thanks. And so the motion um, is approved unanimously. So thank you for that. We move on to the last, the last substantive agenda item, and then we'll move on to public comment on non-agenda items. It is the personnel report. Dave, is there any, I don't know which person is Dave on here. Everyone has Missoula County Public Schools up. Um, Dave, is there anything to point out about the personnel report if you're here? Well, I am. This would be your typical um, first of the month monthly report, personnel report. Any questions for Dave? I don't see any hands up on my end. Happen? Any hands up in the boardroom? There are none. Okay. Then the recommendation is that the trustees approve the items on the personnel report. Is there a motion to approve those items on the personnel report? Moved by Trustee Wake. Is there a second? Trustee Sturbis. Okay. It, trustee, second by Trustee Sturbis. I saw um, Trustee McConnell's hand a second too late. And so it's been moved and seconded. Is there any public comment? Again, we don't take comments on specific individuals in the report, just general comments. See none. Any public comment with the same caveat? See none. Then all trustees in favor of the motion to approve the items on the provided personnel report, please indicate by raising your hand or saying yes. Holland, Trustee Holland is a yes. Trustee McDonald, Trustee um, Wake, and Trustee Decker are all raising their hands. And Trustee Vogel? Vogel is yes. And then in the boardroom, Captain, if you can identify 
how trustees are voting. Trustee Mercer, Trustee Sturbis, Trustee Oldperson, Trustee Lorenzen, Trustee Abgaris, and Trustee Hobbins all vote yes. So the motion passes unanimously. And as I just indicated in my earlier comments, we also allow public comment on non-agenda items at the end of every board meeting, although only statutorily required to take public comment on non-agenda items once. But in case someone wasn't able to make the beginning of the meeting, it's now a second opportunity to uh, make public comment on non-agenda items. Is there anyone who wants to make public comment on any non-agenda item? I'm not seeing any hands up. So with that, we are adjourned. And thank you everyone for being here. Really appreciate it. Good night. Thanks, Marcia. Thank you, Chair Allen. Thanks to all the trustees and all the public. Thank you so much for your participation.